Hey gamers, Treant Monk here. So let's talk about equipment today. Let's talk about both magic items and mundane items. Uh, now magic items, it really depends on the campaign. I've seen DMs who allow characters to craft their own magic items. I've seen DMs who ask uh, players for a wish list for their characters and they'll make sure to throw those kind of magic items into their campaign. And I've seen, and most commonly for me, uh, DMs who just throw in random magic items and then you just have to deal with what you get. Uh, so when I talk about magic items, it's important to note that we aren't necessarily going to be choosing our own magic items, but sometimes we are. So I think number one, we want to talk about which items look really good. And number two, if we don't have a choice of what magic items we get, which magic items that show up to the party might we want to try to claim? Uh, because I think there's certain kinds of magic items that a wizard's going to benefit more from than other characters, and then there's other items we might think we might benefit more from that were just as well to give to somebody else. Also, we need to talk about holding stuff in your hands, because, of course, when you cast a spell with a somatic component, it's assumed you need to have a hand free to cast. Secondly, if you cast a spell with a material component, you need to be either holding an arcane focus or touching an arcane focus or have a spell component pouch that you can access with the free hand. So we have to actually manage our items. You can't just go from using your magic missile wand to your staff of power to something else without thinking about how you're doing that. What are you holding in your hands? Do you have to stow something? Do you have to drop something in order to access the item that you need? And is that going to affect anything else over the next round? So let's deck out our wizards in some bling today. Welcome to Treat Monk's Guide to Wizards. Let's start by talking about some mundane items. These are the items that we really can pick. We can take them right at character creation, right at level one, and these are the choices I would make and why. So first let's talk about the all-important adventuring gear. As a wizard, if we take our standard starting equipment, we get to choose between a scholar's pack or an explorer's pack. And so which one do you want? Well, if we look at the value of these two packs, there's a significant difference. The scholar's pack is worth 40 gold. The explorer's pack is worth only 10 gold. However, generally speaking, if I'm playing a first level wizard, I'll want the explorer's pack instead of the scholar's pack because the scholar's pack is including things like parchment and ink and a candle and a bag of sand. These are things that we're assuming they're using for writing and studying. But if we're copying magic spells into our spell book, we're not going to be using standard ink. We need to use special inks. So those aren't the inks that are included with the scholar's pack. So it's not really helping us there. What the scholar's pack is missing are things like rope, uh, your mess kit, uh, bedroll, uh, very standard stuff you need, assuming that you're in an adventuring party. So unless you have some extra gold for which to buy the Explorer's Pack, I actually recommend the Explorer's Pack even though it has lower value. Then we're going to have to choose between an Arcane Focus and a Component Pouch. Uh, and I've always said in my videos, I'll always choose the Component Pouch over the Arcane Focus. And I'm just going to explain really quickly why. Now I go more in detail. I have a video, I'm going to link it, uh, talking about casting with your hands full. Uh, but when it comes to component pouch versus an arcane focus, here's the difference. Number one, if we choose to multi-class into something else that can cast spells, like we take a one-level cleric dip, which isn't a bad dip for a wizard to take. Uh, if we want to be able to do material components from both those classes, the component pouch covers us. The arcane focus does not. We can't use our arcane focus to cast cleric spells. And the second one is fairly rare. Also with spells that consume a material component that does not have a costly value. Uh, and that's like the protection from good and evil spell. You'll see that it has a component that has no cost, but the spell does consume it. In those cases, the component pouch can provide that component. The arcane focus cannot provide the component for any spell where the material component is consumed, whether it has value or not. So in both those cases, we're better off with the component pouch than the arcane focus. So I always choose the component pouch instead. The next piece of equipment I recommend is a bullseye lantern. And you'll, of course, you'll need some oil, and you'll need some flint and steel to get it going. Uh, but a bullseye lantern is really the premium lighting ability. Just because you have the light spell doesn't mean you don't need some other source of light. A bullseye lantern can shed light for 120 feet. That's probably 
double the range of people's dark vision and triple the range of your light spell. So because of that, the Bullseye Lantern is pretty unique in the amount of light it can shed. And also remember that if you're using things like dark vision, it's considered to be dim light, so you have disadvantage on perception checks. So no disadvantage on those perception checks, only on perception checks from 60 feet to 120 feet. So it's really a good piece of equipment to have. Uh, you don't necessarily need to use it all the time, but having it, even if you have a light spell, is a good idea. Another piece of equipment I like to have with my wizard, I generally play wizards who like to do battlefield control. So if I can get battlefield control without expending a spell, it makes sense. So I like to have ball bearings and I like to have caltrops. They're both useful battlefield control tools, especially at low levels when we don't have a lot of spell slots. So let's talk about magic items. Uh, the first thing we should talk about when we talk about magic items is that we don't always get to pick what magic items we get. And there is no way I can go through the list of all the magic items available and talk about which ones are good or even list all the ones that are good. That would be an expansive video. What I'm talking about here are some highlights and then I'm going to really talk about the types of magic items that we're looking for, the types of bonuses that really appeal to wizards. Now before we get into any specific items, I want to talk about some general things. I want to talk about scrolls, I want to talk about staffs, I want to talk about wands. So when it comes to spell scrolls, if they're on the wizard list, we can use them. And generally speaking, of course, we're going to want all the wizard scrolls we can get. So what we can do is we can use those scrolls to scribe that spell in our spell book. Ideally, that's what we want to do if we don't have that spell. It's always better to have access to that spell forever than get it for one use. However, I don't always do that. There's a couple cases. If the spell on a scroll is super circumstantial. That is one of those cases where I might save it in scroll form because I'm not necessarily going to ever want to prepare that spell, but by having it on a scroll, it's always available to me. And then when I need it, it's there and I can cast it right away. I don't have to wait and re-prepare my spells. The second time I would keep a scroll is if I already have it in my book. If I already have it in my book, then it's just an extra spell. It's just an extra casting. and It's good to have. Now, keep in mind that you can only cast spells that you can currently cast a level of. So if you get, say, a fireball spell and you are a second level wizard, you can't automatically cast that spell. Now, you can attempt to cast it. And if you attempt to cast a spell that you normally couldn't, the DC is equal to 10 plus the level of the spell, and you need to make an ability check based on your intelligence. So again, let's talk about our second level wizard gets a fireball spell. Uh, so if they attempt to cast that fireball scroll, the DC of that scroll would be a 13, and then assuming that our wizard probably has an intelligence of 16 or 17, means they'd have about a 55% chance of it succeeding. And if they fail, then you go on the scroll mishap table. And you just don't want to do that. We're not going to go through the entire mishap table. Generally speaking, only attempt to cast a scroll that's not 100% in an absolute emergency. I would avoid it if I can at all. Now the thing I want to talk about with wands and staves is whether they can be used as an arcane focus because this is still a matter of some debate. The player's handbook tells us that arcane focuses are crafted specifically for the purpose of being arcane focuses. So you can't pick up any quarter staff and use it as an arcane focus. And generally speaking, if you buy a staff as an arcane focus, it's not necessarily a quarter staff. Uh, so these things aren't always interchangeable. Now, are magic items that are wands or staffs automatically made to be arcane focuses? The rules do not say. Uh, now, Jeremy Crawford has said that he thinks that all wands should be arcane focuses. And logically, we would assume that magic staves that are usable by wizards would also be considered arcane focuses. Uh, but we know that just because Jeremy Crawford says doesn't necessarily make it raw. Uh, so if we want to look at the rules as they're written, there is no answer. You need to find out from your dungeon master whether they are or not. I think reasonably they are. And the reason I think that is because we have magic items that specifically say that they can be used as an arcane focus. But there are no staffs, there are no wands that say specifically that they can be used as an arcane focus. So from that, logically and reasonably, I think we have to assume the intent was that they all can be used as arcane focuses, and they just neglected to mention it in the Dungeon Master's Guide. Uh, so take that as you will, but certainly I would expect that I could use a wand or a staff as an arcane focus.
So something we should mention is, of course, some wizards will do melee. We've talked about this a little bit already when we're talking about party roles, but yes, some wizards will either dip into melee once in a while, or they are in melee as their primary purpose. In those cases, we definitely want to get a magic staff if we can. And specifically the staffs that say they can be used as a quarter staff in battle, they often have a plus to hit, because then we are holding something that is considered an arcane focus, and that will satisfy the material component of our spells. Because remember, if we are using a shield and a sword, even if we have the Warcaster feat, that doesn't satisfy any spell that has the material component. But if you have a spell focus in your hand, then it does. Now, I'm not going to go over any specific spell scrolls. Like I said, if they're on the wizard list, we generally want them. Uh, obviously, we want the best spells most, but I'll take any spell I can get on the wizard list. It doesn't really make sense not to put any spell we can in our spell book. The cost is cheap. It doesn't take very much time, and it is just a tool that's there. You don't have to prepare it, but you have it if you need it. Now, when we go over magic items, I'm going to go over in terms of rarity. So we're going to talk about common magic items first, legendary magic items last. So common magic items, these ones tend to have very little value, and they tend to do very little. That doesn't mean we don't want them. Uh, they tend to come up more at low level. And to a large degree, they don't use attunement slots, so we can generally keep them even when we're at high level. Uh, the first one I want to mention is the Potion of Healing. The Potion of Healing is available right from the player's handbook, cost you 50 gold. That suggests to me that it's available in the city for purchase. Useful thing for you to have. If you look at Find Familiar, it's reasonable to assume that at least some familiars would be capable of delivering a healing potion with their action to a party member that needs it. So when we look at our action economy, that's the best kind of healing you can do because it's not using your bonus action, it's not using any spells, and it's bringing up allies that have gone down. Something that happens a lot more at lower levels, uh, so that is just a tactic at lower levels to be effective as a wizard. Uh, that makes having at least a few healing potions pretty vital. Another item that I think deserves some attention is the Enduring Spellbook. This is from Xanathar's, and this spellbook basically can't be damaged by fire or water or anything like that. Uh, now, I find generally speaking, when I play in a campaign, the DMs, for the most part, don't go after your spellbook. They don't try to damage your spellbook. They generally don't try to take it away from you uh, because they know that without your spellbook, you really can't do very much as a wizard. But it just makes sense to me that if I'm a wizard, this is an item I'm going to want to have. And then at least we don't have to worry about those couple little things. Now, here's an item I think is just cool. Again, when we're talking about common magic items, we're not talking about powerful magic items. We're talking about the weakest of the weak. Uh, but a common magic item that I would definitely take, if I could, is a Cloak of Billowing. This one, all it does is, when we want it to, it billows like it's in the wind. Now, if I'm thinking about how my character looks when they're casting spells, I just like that. So if that came available, I'd snap it right up. Now, we kind of need to talk about the Hat of Wizardry, because this one is specifically for wizards, requires attunement by a wizard. It can be used as an arcane focus, and we can use it to cast a wizard cantrip that we don't know. Uh, we can do this once per day, and if we do, we need to make an arcana check. It's a pretty easy check. If that check succeeds, the cantrip is cast. Now, if I had a free attunement slot, of course, I'm going to take this. Why not? Having it as an arcane focus is handy, probably not necessary. We probably have a component pouch, uh, but being able to cast a cantrip that we don't have or even have the chance to cast a cantrip that we normally don't have, is occasionally going to be handy. It's not going to be great. I mean, at high levels, we generally aren't casting cantrips at all. And at low levels, we've taken the best cantrips for our character. So we're really just talking about those circumstantial little things where, gee, I wish I had the Dancing Light spell right now. Uh, then we could use it for that. Uh, but as soon as that attunement slot became an issue, the Hat of Wizardry is gone, for sure. It is not a great magic item for wizards, but it's okay, and if it showed up, I would certainly take it. Now, for those martial wizards who do go into melee, the Ruby of the War Mage is a fantastic item. Now, it does require attunement, so we need to think about that, but still, we can attach to any weapon we want, and now that weapon can be used as an arcane focus. So if you are doing sword and shield, and you have a great magical sword, 
you're going to have trouble casting spells with material components unless you find some way to make that sword into an arcane focus. Ruby of the War Mage is the way to do that. Uh, so although it uses an attunement slot, in those cases, I could still see it being worthwhile. Otherwise, what you have to do is you have to use your free action to stow your weapon so you can cast your spell, and then you can't draw it again, right, until the next turn. So during that period of time, we're unarmed. Uh, and so creatures that provoke attacks of opportunity, that kind of thing, it could really be a problem that way. So being able to turn your weapon into an arcane focus is just going to solve a lot of problems for you. So let's move into some cool uncommon items. The first is the Pearl of Power. This has got to be one of my favorite magic items for a wizard because it gives you an extra spell slot of third level or lower. And generally speaking, if we have third level spells, that's the one we're going to want to replace. Uh, and it's just an extra casting, which I'll always take over something like a wand or a staff because those aren't always the spells we want. The spells we want are the ones we're preparing. We picked those spells. We prepared those spells. They're the best spells for us. So extra castings of that is fantastic. And a Pearl of Power will do that for you. Now it does require attunement, which means at high levels is getting one extra third level slot worth attunement. Probably not eventually. Eventually, great magic items are going to start coming up. But if we're at that level where tuning uncommon magic items makes sense, this has got to be the top of the list for me. Next item I want to mention is the Ever Smoking Bottle. I like this one a lot too. Although it duplicates a spell effect and it doesn't need to be used by a spellcaster, I think it makes sense for the wizard to have it. Uh, because the wizard is the one that's spending their actions on things like battlefield control, things like a fog cloud spell. But unlike a fog cloud spell, this isn't going to use our concentration. That means we can cast other spells that require concentration while benefiting from the fog cloud created from the ever smoking bottle. Just a lovely combination. Uh, now, I'm a fan of the Fog Cloud spell. There are some people out there who don't think it's very useful. At some point, I'm probably going to do a video where I really talk about the Fog Cloud spell and how it can be used effectively. But if you've already found ways to use Fog Cloud effectively, Ever Smoking Bottle is a good choice should it come up. The next thing I want to talk about is the Bag of Holding. Of course, we can talk about handy haversacks. We can talk about portable holes. Generally speaking, as you get higher in level, you're going to start acquiring loot. As you start acquiring loot, you're going to want somewhere you can store it. And the Bag of Holding is kind of the iconic choice there. Uh, there are other choices. Generally, I like to have one of them. Now, it doesn't have to be a Bag of Holding, but a Bag of Holding works just fine. And should something like that come up, I'm going to point out that I'm the one carrying all the costly components. I'm the one carrying all the kind of miscellaneous stuff. Uh, and I'm the one that probably has the lowest strength. So Bag of Holding makes a lot of sense for the wizard over maybe any other party member. Next thing I'll mention is a Broom of Flying. I'm not sure how this is an uncommon item. This item so good, I can't imagine why it is only an uncommon item. It does not require attunement. It allows you to fly at a speed of, speed of 50 feet around. Assumably, we can take a passenger. Of course, once we go over 200 pounds, the speed reduces to 30 feet, but we're still flying. Uh, we can even send this broom off on its own as long as we're familiar with the location and it'll go by autopilot. Uh, so the broom of flying is just a fantastic item and one of the best flying items in the game. Remember, we're flying without using concentration. So this can often get us out of harm's way without using our concentration so we can concentrate on those other spells that are really affecting the battle. This is a terrific combination for a wizard to have. The next uncommon item is the bag of tricks. Now there's three different kinds of bags of tricks and what happens is you reach into them, pull out this fuzzy little ball, you throw it down and it turns into an animal that's random based off a chart that depends on the color of the bag of tricks you have. And the gray one is generally the worst, uh, the tan one is generally the best. Now when you do this, you get this creature, it is friendly to you, it obeys your commands, you can command it with a bonus action. Or you can just use it to throw in front of you and have something in the way. Uh, so this is kind of a useful thing for a wizard to have. It's not using your concentration, and it's essentially a summoned creature. And we can get creatures that are reasonably good, like a tiger or an axe beak. These are large creatures. They take up a lot of space. If you're in a 10-foot hallway and you throw down a creature and it turns into an axe beak, you've just prevented the enemy from being able to access your wizard. In terms of battlefield control alone, that is valuable. Even though that axe may not take a lot of hit points before it goes down, they have to stop, they have to attack it, and then move on, and they've already used their action on attacking the axe beak. So this is very useful to us. And if we are low level, 
Uh, even the small creatures can make a difference if they're ignored by the enemy. We can always use them to deliver a help action to an ally using our bonus action. That's a good deal, generally speaking. So even if I draw something like a rat out of the Megatrix, I can still make use of that. Now the duration of this is terrific too. It lasts until the next dawn, and then we can do it three times a day, which means we can have three creatures at the same time if we want. Now remember, one bonus action to command, which means we're not commanding multiple creatures at once. But by summoning three creatures, then we can really choose between three random creatures which one is going to suit us best. So that still might be useful. And then the next day we can use it again. This is not limited charges. We can use this item forever. It's an uncommon item. Does not require attunement. Wow, just a great magic item to have. And if I can get it with my wizard, I'll grab it up. Now what I find with Begatrix is it often is underrated by players. They'll look at the list and they'll look and see that they can get things like a rat or a weasel. And they think, oh, this sounds kind of useless. Does anybody want this? Yeah, I'll take it. 100%. Great item. Now obviously I'm going to have to mention the Stone of Good Luck. Stone of Good Luck is just a nice item to have. It does require attunement, but it's going to give you a plus one on all saving throws and all ability checks. Remember, when we get a bonus to ability checks, that means we're also getting bonus to initiative because initiative is a dexterity check. Uh, so it's plus one initiative, plus one to all skills, plus one to all saving throws. Not a huge bonus, but it covers so many things. Nice item to have, does require attunement, not necessarily something I'm going to keep at high levels, but at mid-levels, a lovely item. Now, an item you wouldn't necessarily consider for the wizard, but I think is terrific for the wizard, is the Weapon of Warning. Uh, weapon of Warning, what it does is, it's a weapon that's magical, and you have to attune to it, and it'll give you advantage on your initiative rolls. It'll make sure that you and anyone within 30 feet of you can never be surprised, uh, and it'll wake you up if there's danger nearby if you're sleeping. All terrific things, all great for a wizard, and because it's a weapon that doesn't provide any bonuses, and of course, weapons aren't always something that any player wants. I've played in lots of campaigns where we find something like a magic longsword, and you've got your two-handed weapon user, uh, so they don't want it, or your dexterity-based character, so they don't want it. So then it's about, I wonder what we could get for this. But if it is a weapon of warning, snap it up. That's a great item. Advantage on initiative checks alone is worth an attunement slot. And that's something to remember too. I'm not gonna mention every item that gives advantage on initiative rolls, but any one that does, I recommend. Now I'm gonna mention wing boots as well. I don't think they're as good as the broom of flying, but we don't always get to choose, right? You And whenever something comes up that can give us flying, we'll take it. Now wing boots are going to use our attunement slot. Wing boots do have a duration, so it makes more sense for them to be uncommon than the broom of flying but they're still a good item for us to have if we can get them because it's concentration less flight and that is terrific for us to have because if melee is getting nasty we don't want to be anywhere near it and remember our spells tend to be cast at range so that's not an issue for us and unless enemies have ranged attacks we can get out of harm's way entirely and finally for uncommon magic items the cloak of protection obviously a good item for any party member so you may not get first choice on Cloak of Protection because the fighter is going to point out that it's going to increase their armor class, and they really like that. Uh, but if we can get one, it's good because, yeah, armor class is good for us too. Plus one bonus to all saving throws, terrific for us, and it helps our concentration saves. So if we can get it, we probably want to grab one, but remember that too requires an attunement slot. Uh, and I will point out that if you can get a Stone of Good Luck, and you can get a Cloak of Protection, you're getting plus two on all saving throws. These do stack but three attunement slots, so when we have one free, Cloak of Protection, terrific. When we don't have one free, we're going to have to make a judgment call. So let's get into some rare magic items. Uh, and the first one I want to mention is Amulet of Health. Oh, Amulet of Health, lovely. Brings your constitution score to 19. Now it does require attunement. I'll use an attunement slot to get a constitution score of 19. Now I have seen wizard builds where the constitution starts at 16. So we're already at a plus three. In those cases, it's maybe not such a big deal. But I have also seen wizard builds that are still relatively optimized that have constitution scores that only give a plus one bonus to constitution. In those cases, getting a 19 constitution is massive. Now remember, this isn't gonna stack with things like resilient constitution that would normally raise your constitution. Uh, we can't raise our constitution to 20 based off of this, uh, but 19 constitution, that's plus four bonus. That's a lot more hit points. That's a lot higher concentration save. That's a lot higher other kinds of constitution saves as well. Uh, so I think for the wizard to have this item makes a lot of sense. 
Obviously, if anyone in your party has a terrible constitution score, they're going to benefit from it the most. But we may actually have one of the lower constitution scores in the party. It really depends on the party makeup. Next is bracers of defense. We're kind of obvious choice for this item. It can only be used by somebody who's not using any armor and not using a shield. That's us. So we get our bracers of defense. That's a plus two AC. It requires attunement. Plus two AC is actually a pretty big bonus, probably worth the attunement slot uh, at most levels. Now how about the cloak of displacement? That's a terrific item for us to have. So first off, it gives disadvantage on attack rolls against us. And secondly, if you do take damage, then it ceases to function until the beginning of your next turn. Now, as a wizard, we're the least likely to take damage, so we're the most likely to get the most use out of this item. We have a reasonable claim on this item, should it come up. So the cube of force. If a cube of force comes up, you want your wizard to have it. The cube of force is a charged item, and it's one of those items that regains charges each day, and it uh, provides defense. And our character chooses one side of the cube to press, and it will prevent certain things from coming through. Now, if we press the fifth side of the cube, it blocks everything. And with a wizard, especially, this can be really useful because if we are concentrating on a spell that's really important, then we can use the cube of force and we basically take ourselves out of the combat. And that doesn't require a concentration. So we're concentrating on that powerful ability and now the enemy has no way to break our concentration. Uh, so the cube of force, perfect for a wizard. If you can get it, you want that item. It requires attunement, and that attunement is attunement I would probably give it right to level 20. Now there are certain spells that can weaken your cube of force. Uh, things like a disintegrate spell. Uh, it will remove charges from the cube. So you would do the disintegrate spell, roll a d12, and that many charges come off. But the cube of force has 36 charges, so that's a lot of disintegrate spells you're going to have to do to get through it. So in general, once you press that fifth side, you're pretty safe. One that often doesn't get thought about is Elven Chain, because Elven Chain, we might assume that we can't use it because it's armor, but Elven Chain does not require proficiency in armor, so it's a really good choice for us to have. Now it's only a chain shirt, so we're talking about a plus three armor class, and then we get an additional plus one from the Elven Chain, so that's a 14 base armor class, plus we can have up to two dexterity, so that's a 16 armor class potentially. So if we have a dexterity that's higher than 15, then the Elven Shirt might not be much better for us than Mage Armor. Then there's a Ring of Protection. Ring of Protection gives plus one to armor class and saving throws, and it can be combined with a Cloak of Protection, and it can be combined with a Stone of Luck. So if you want to use all three of your attunement slots, you can have plus three on all your saves from those items. Not the most interesting item, but of course it's reasonably effective. Now I would have a ton of unsubscribers today if I don't mention the Ring of Spell Storing, because the Ring of Spell Storing is the one item that the wizard will murder the other party members to get. And the reason you want this so badly is because you can stick it on the hand of your familiar. Now a Ring of Spell Storing can hold up to five levels worth of spells, so that could be one fifth level spell, it could be five first level spells. Uh, but the big thing here is, if you put it on the hand of your familiar, not only are you improving your action economy, because then you can technically cast two spells in a round, and whatever your familiar uses from this ring is going to use your spell DC, uh, and it's going to be treated as if you cast it. So it's not like it's weakened by being cast through the familiar. And the second thing is, it's going to allow you to concentrate on more than one thing at one time. So your familiar could be concentrating on a hypnotic pattern, for example, while maybe you're concentrating on a haste on a party member. Uh, so you can combine the concentrations, you can combine the number of spells, you can cast it around. So this is something that just takes a first level spell and turns you into almost this double wizard. It's just an obvious item for the wizard to have, and if you can get it, it is going to multiply your power significantly. Next, let's talk about the Horn of Valhalla. We might not even consider ourselves as the obvious choice for that, but we really are. The Horn of Valhalla does not require attunement, and it gives you a summoning option that requires one action, and then you get a number of warriors that can be anywhere within 60 feet of you. So we're talking about battlefield control and non-concentration battlefield control. So we blow the horn, we get a number of creatures, we choose where they go, they're gonna block off our wizard, they're gonna provide assistance to our allies, so very useful altogether. It can only be used once every seven days. But again, it doesn't require attunement. So if we find one, we want to keep it. And if we keep it, generally speaking, I think the wizard is the one to have it. Now, generally speaking, 
a magic staff that a wizard can attune to, I want it because it's extra spells and extra spells is always good. Spell slots are a problem for wizards. Uh, you run out of them. You end up casting cantrips. But when you have things like a staff or a wand, then that can really alleviate that. And then suddenly we're casting real spells all the time. Uh, but one staff I want to call out specifically is the staff of swarming insects. This one is super lovely for a wizard. Now, you might think swarming insects, maybe a druid makes more sense. I think the wizard is the one for this item. The reason I think this item is so good for wizards is it has an ability called the insect cloud. And you use one charge from the staff and it creates this cloud of harmless insects around you uh, that remain for 10 minutes and they cause heavy obscurement. So again, if we're concentrating on something, this is a great way for us to provide ourselves some defense uh, that helps us maintain that concentration. And when we can do that, when we have items that can prevent us being attacked after we're concentrating on a spell, that's great for our economy. A fighter needs to be able to attack every round. A blaster needs to be able to blast every round. But if we are playing a wizard that's concentrating on things like control, once we have that control in place, then yeah, we can do cantrips in the meantime, or we could even cast fireballs in the meantime. But we've done our most effective thing already. And the most important thing after that is don't lose concentration. And if we can do things that provide us good defense without using our concentration, they're useful to us. And the Staff of Swarming Insects just happens to have an ability that works very well with this. Now, I should say, if you're playing a druid that is a summoner or concentrating on summoning, then it makes sense for you too, for the exact same reason. The last rare magic item I want to talk about is the Mantle of Spell Resistance. This is a cloak, requires attunement, gives you advantage on saves versus spells. So, obviously, we want to have this if we can get it. Because when we're making saving throws on spells, often either it's going to be something that entirely screws us over, like a dominate person, or it's going to be something that is going to do damage to us, like a fireball. And if we reduce it, it'll make that concentration save easier afterwards, never mind the fact that we don't have a lot of hit points. So let's get into our very rare items. And the first one I'm going to talk about is the Amulet of the Planes. Now, we are potentially a character that can already do things like the Plane Shift spell, but spell preparations are valuable, and Amulet of the Plains requires an intelligence check to use properly. And who's going to have the best intelligence check in the party? The wizard. Now keep in mind, just because we have the best intelligence check in the party does not make this an automatic thing. The DC on this is 15, so if you can prepare for it by finding other ways to improve abilities checks, uh, things like guidance, you want to use them here. Because if you fail that roll, you're going to go to another random location. And there are certain planes you just don't want to go to. Next, let's talk about Ion Stones. Now, Ion Stones aren't all very rare. In fact, they can go anywhere up to Legendary. Uh, and there's a lot of different kinds, and I'm just not going to go through them. Instead, I'm just going to provide some basics. So, which Ion Stones do we want? Well, we want ones that can absorb spells. If spells are thrown at us, and we can absorb them, we want those. Uh, the second is, if we have something that increases our proficiency bonus, or increases our spell DC, we want that too. Because spell DC, of course, is very important for a wizard. So it is very useful for us to have that. Uh, if the ones that increase our intelligence, I think for the most part we're going to get to a 20 intelligence on our own anyways. But if we're not at a 20 intelligence yet, then maybe we want to have it temporarily. And then once we can get to an intelligence of 20 on our own, we might give it to another party member who might benefit from it. Remember, these are using attunement slots. I'm not going to want to hold an attunement slot to keep my intelligence from an 18 to 20 when I could just raise it to 20 and free up that attunement slot. Uh, no feat is worth that. The Rod of Absorption is just about the premier item a wizard can get because it's going to absorb spells that we can then convert into spell slots. Now, it is going to use your attunement. Who cares? This is always going to be worth one of your attunement slots. One of the best items a wizard can get in the game. Better than a lot of legendary items. Definitely, if a Rod of Absorption comes up, uh, this is an item that you want over anybody else in the party. Now, the Rod of Alertness is a lovely item for a wizard to have. It also requires attunement, but you're getting advantage on perception rolls and on your initiative checks. Both terrific things to have. And there are a number of spells it allows you to cast, and it's not going to require a ritual, it's not going to require the 10 minutes, it's not going to require you preparing the spells. And that's Detect Evil and Good, Detect Magic, Detect Poison and Disease, and see invisibility. All circumstantial spells, but useful, and we and none of them use charges, we can just cast them as often as we like. And then finally we can use an action to do the protective aura. 
which is okay. It's not really the reason we want this, but if we use our action to do the protective aura, it gives everyone a little bit of a boost. Uh, so it's something we might do if we're concentrating on something else. Uh, but in general, it's that advantage on initiative checks and the advantage on perception rolls that really make this something. This is the rarity level where a lot of the staves come into play. So you've got your Staff of Power, your Staff of Fire, your Staff of Frost. They're all good. Uh, I would love to have any of them if they come up. Now remember that things like Fireball or Cone of Cold, even though I don't consider these to be the best spells for wizards, they are spells that you can cast when you're concentrating on something else. So you concentrate on that spell that really is one of your best spells, and then you can throw a Fireball or you can use a cone of cold and you didn't have to prepare it and you don't have to use any spell slots on it. So nice to have in those cases. Also, these are good spells for getting rid of fodder. They're, neither of them are bad spells. Now, a Staff of Power is particularly great because you can do things like Wall of Force and Globe of Invulnerability. These are fantastic spells. Best spells you're going to get from a Staff. Of course, we have to talk, if we're talking about Staff of Power, we have to talk about the fact we can use it for a Retributive Strike, which means we can break the Staff, and it does a ton of damage to everybody around us, and there's good chance we're going to die, but a small chance we will survive. Now, if I have a Staff of Power, I basically do not want to destroy it, because it is one of the best items in the game for a Wizard. But I have used the Retributive Strike with a Wizard, and the way I've done it is, we were basically near the end of a campaign. We were working our way through this prism of just insanely tough encounters until we came to an encounter where Tiamat is coming out from another plane, uh, tougher than the Tiamat in Rise of Dragons too. This one was just terrible. Uh, and we had to run away. And what we did is we had my wizard cast a magic jar and then use the jarred creature to go in and break the staff and it took care of a whole lot because there were dragons everywhere in this fight and it took care of a ton of them because the staff had its full charge so that's 320 hit points to everything around it uh, and the creature that did it died and my magic jar returned my, my wizard to his normal body and then we immediately went in and cleaned up uh, and we were able to win a fight that was almost impossible for us to win a huge cost giving up a staff of power but again we were at the end of the campaign so it wasn't a big deal Obviously, if you can get a Tome of Clear Thought, you want to grab that too, because that can increase your intelligence up to a 22. Or even if you don't increase your intelligence to 22 with it, it increases the maximum for your intelligence to 22. So you'll eventually get there. And that means eventually you can get that plus 6 intelligence bonus that's going to increase your spell DC. And that's what's so important. So let's talk about the legendary magic items. Obviously, we're never going to be choosing our legendary magic items, but if these come up, these are ones I would seriously talk to the party about giving to the wizard. The first is the Scarab of Protection. Uh, Scarab of Protection requires attunement, but basically if there's any harmful effect coming from Undead or any necromancy spell, and we fail a saving throw, we can make it instead. We also have advantage on saving throws against all spells. So defensively, this is very useful to us, regardless of whether we're fighting undead or necromancers, but if we are, then it's doubly useful for us. The Scarab has 12 charges. Once the 12th charge is used, it crumbles into dust. Now the thing about the secondary ability that uses the charges is that it's our choice whether to use it or not. So if I only have one charge left, I can just simply choose not to use it and just retain the advantage of saving throws versus spells. That's probably worth an attunement slot anyway. Now obviously we have to talk about what is considered to be the premier item for wizards, which is the Staff of the Magi. It's kind of the iconic ultimate item, the item that every wizard dreams about having. Uh, because this essentially combines a very powerful magic staff with a rod of absorption. Uh, so two of the best items you can have combined into one item, one attunement slot. So obviously if this comes up, you want the wizard to have it. And obviously any wizard will love to have this item if it comes up. And one thing I will mention though is I actually prefer the spell list on the Staff of Power to the one on the Staff of the Magi. But don't get me wrong, there's still good spells on there. It's just not my favorite spells in the game. Of course, just like the Staff of Power, you can use the Retributive Strike, except you can have 50 charges on your Staff of the Magi. If you're absorbing spells, you can absorb up to 50 charges, which means you could potentially do 800 points of damage with that. Uh, again, not something I'm ever going to do unless I'm in like one of the final fights of the campaign. Uh, but it's just worthy to note. You can do a, just a massive amount of damage with that. Cloak of Invisibility, Ring of Invisibility, both require attunement. 
both allow you to become invisible without using your concentration, which means when you're concentrating on something else, it's very useful for you to become invisible because, of course, it's much harder to target you. There are certain spells that won't be able to target you at all, uh, and attacks will have disadvantage. So either of those are great for the same reason. When we can improve our defense, you can see that I'm kind of concentrating on those kind of items. Things that increase our armor class, things that increase our saving throws, things that make attacks against us harder to do. We want all those items. Those are the kind of items that we want to focus on. How about the Tome of the Stilled Tongue? This is an item from Vecna, and it can be used as your spell book and can be used as your spell focus. And once per day, you can cast a spell from the book using a bonus action and no spell slot, no verbal or somatic components. So there are some creative uses there. Not having a verbal or somatic component essentially means that it's going to be like getting the subtle spell meta metamagic for that. And then the bonus action casting is like getting the quicken spell metamagic for that. Uh, so this can improve our spell economy, especially when we can use our standard action for something else. Or, of course, there's always the advantage of being able to do it against somebody who doesn't know that you've cast a spell. Super powerful, super useful. Now Vecna's supposed to be keeping an eye on you if you have this item the DM might do something with that. Uh, it's something to keep in mind. Ring of Spell Turning, same thing. Advantage on saving throws versus spells is very useful for a wizard. Uh, if you roll a 20 on that save, the spell actually reverses against the caster. Now, keep in mind, this doesn't work on area of effect spells. So if you're hit with something like a hypnotic pattern, we can't use that to reverse this on the spellcaster, but we're still getting advantage on the saving throw, and that's kind of the main thing. Generally speaking, we don't get 20s very often on our saving throws, usually about 10% of the time if we have advantage. So I wouldn't expect that to be coming up a lot. The main thing is advantage on saving throws versus spells. It's always useful to have. There's a number of ways we've looked at now that we can get that. Uh, this is just another one of them. Any of them that come up, if we can get one of them, that's just lovely to have. And then the other main item that wizards talk about, other than the Staff of the Magi, is the Robe of the Arch Magi. Uh, and these ones are corresponding to alignment. There's a good, neutral, and evil version, and you can only use the one that corresponds to your own alignment. So that means even if you find one, it doesn't necessarily mean you're going to be able to use it. But as long as you get one that you can use, it's insanely good. It might be the best item for a wizard in the game. It might even be better than a Staff of the Magi, uh, because you were increasing our spell DC by two with this. We're also getting a base armor class of 15 plus our dexterity modifier. Remember, this can be increased by other methods. We might have bracers of defense. We might have rings of protection. That's just the base armor class. And then I add on top of that, that we're going to have advantage on all saves versus magic. So three great abilities all combined together with one attunement slot. Now this isn't something that you're going to have to choose who gets it. Generally speaking, if a robe with the arch magi comes up, if anyone can use it, there's only going to be one person who can use it. So if it comes up and you can use it, of course you're going to get it. Uh, I'm just saying that is it worth an attunement slot? Yeah, it's number one on the list on your attunement slots. If you have this, you're never going to bump it for anything ever, obviously. So these are all the magic items that I really wanted to highlight, but I'm hoping that I brought across a certain idea in terms of tactics, because again, we don't know what magic items are going to come up, so which ones do we want to have? So when we're looking at our magic items, there's certain things I tend to look at as important for a wizard. The first is if there's any way to improve our spell slots. This can be done uh, with magic scrolls, it can be done with magic staves or wands, uh, or things like a pearl of power. But anything that gives us more spells, always good. Anything that improves our initiative is always good. If we can get advantage on initiative checks, if we can improve our initiative score for any way, that's always really good for a wizard, because control and debuffing tends to be better than other things you can do if you go first. Uh, and then anything we can do to improve our defense, I always love. Anything that improves our defense. That's why I like all those flying items. It's useful to be away from the enemies. Uh, and then anything that can provide us invisibility, or any other kind of disadvantage on attack rolls against us, or anything that can improve our saving throws for anything, especially against spells. So those are the priorities. Initiative, defense, spells. Items that do that, those are the ones we're going to want to grab. Anything else might be better off for another party member. So I hope this helps you equip your wizard. I hope it helps you when magic items come up, knowing which ones you want versus the ones that you might want somebody else to have. Uh, and until next time, enjoy your wizards. I'm going to sit back and I'm going to relax. I'm going to have some fun. D&D is for everyone. Thanks, and I'll see you next time. Mm -hmm.